Hey guys, it's Kay from Asian Boss. More and more celebrities around the world are taking time out to help address social issues in their countries. Among them is Cinta Laura, a famous actress and singer in Indonesia. With more than 7 million followers on Instagram alone, she has been lending her fame to address issues related to violence against women and children, as well as education. We recently had a chance to talk with her to get to know why she's so passionate about these issues. This is how the interview went. By the way, don't forget to hit the notification bell for more insightful videos like this. Without further ado, let's get to the interview. So thank you so much, Chinta, for chatting with Asian Boss today. <laughs> Thanks for having me here today. How are you doing in terms of your health? Because I, from what I heard that the COVID situation is quite bad in Indonesia. Like, are you staying safe? At least on my end, things are going pretty well and, you know, I'm busy with work. Nonetheless, I'm obviously still taking major health precautions. You know, in regards to COVID-19, Indonesia is not doing too well. Uh, but at the same time, my team and I are doing our best to not go to crowded places. You know, we get tested every one to two weeks. We're always wearing a mask. We're always making sure we wash our hands and essentially staying clean. So we're doing everything we can. So you probably don't have to introduce yourself to Indonesians because you're already very well known there and a top actress and you have millions of followers on Instagram. But we actually have a very global audience who might not be familiar with you. So how would you introduce yourself to them? My name's Chinta Laura Kiel. I'm an actress, I'm a singer and generally an entertainer who loves, you know, this industry so much and I'm also a social activist who's very passionate about creating awareness on the issues of bullying and uh, violence against women and children. But wasn't it education as well? Education as well, yes. Uh, I, I guess the reason why I missed out that part is because education has been such a vital part of my life and fa my family's life and you know we've had this foundation called Sukarseno Peduli for over 15 years now that you know I don't even think of it as me actively trying to you know change the educational system in this country and it's just become a part of my daily life you know it's i think it's it's my obligation to help this country move forward and grow and prosper and that is through education we actually read up that you also were a professional swimmer is that correct like how did that come about <laughs> Prior to entering the entertainment industry, I was a swimmer just in school, but I would compete against other international schools around Asia. But at the age of 12, um, I got my appendix taken out because I had appendicitis. And that's how my career started because during the three months I had off, um, I joined an acting slash modeling competition. The jury happened to be a casting director from one of the biggest production houses in Indonesia. And so I immediately got offered a lead role on a TV, in a TV series. And that's how my career took off. By the time I was 13, my first TV show aired. Within six months, that TV show won best TV show of the year and I won best actress. And I was only 13, almost 14 at the time. So that was a complete shocker to me. And you know, from there on out, like things just skyrocketed. In 2011, I moved to the U.S. because I wanted to pursue my education. But even though I was in the U.S., I still returned to Indonesia in the summers and winters to do TV programs here. So, you know, I've been in the industry now for 13 years and I'm very blessed that, you know, I've been able to stay in the industry for this long. We know that you are a prominent advocate for a lot of different things like child protection and women's rights and education. Yeah, but before we go into all of that in detail, let's explore your background a little bit more. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so as you mentioned, so you are half German and you are half Indonesian, uh, which means Correct. where exactly did you grow up? So my dad worked in the hotel industry. He was a hotelier. Is your dad the German or the Indonesian? German. Ah, uh, okay. Same here. <laughs> I mean, Kiel, remember? My last ah, name right, is Kiel. Right. <laughs> yeah, like yes. super German last so, name. So I 
lived when I was really young. I don't remember any of it. A little bit in the Middle East, Dubai, and then Singapore, Malaysia, finally Germany, and then I moved to Indonesia in my early teens. And um, therefore, English is my mother tongue, so to speak, because I just lived in so many different countries that my parents always had to put me in an international school. And then after Indonesia, I lived in the States for eight years, and now I'm back since 2019. Witnessing different cultures and seeing how different people think has helped me live my life here now that I'm back in Indonesia as an adult, because I've applied the knowledge that I've attained um, in order to hopefully make a positive change here. You listed so many countries that are very different from each other as well. Some sound to be very con like conservative, some are maybe more liberal um, and open-minded maybe. So there are a lot of things I have to learn. Like, you know, I'm still my straightforward self. I refuse to change that about me, but sometimes I have to be mindful of how I say certain things because even though for us, you know, it's like, okay, we're just being honest, we're just being straightforward, there's nothing wrong with that. People here might interpret it as arrogance or us attacking them, even though that's not our intention. So I have to be more mindful of how I say things. And I don't mind, because at the end of the day, as a global citizen, we're supposed to adapt, you know? We can't always expect our way to be the only way. At the end of the day, yes, I'm half Indonesian, and yes, this is my country, but um, there are a lot of things that I still need to learn about the culture, and I have to be willing to do that, because at the end of the day, this is Indonesia, and like we have to respect and love and learn more about the culture. Did you ever um, get any backlash, or did somebody criticize you for being too direct um, in Indonesia? <laughs> what happened? I'm very curious. <laughs> <laughs> all the time, all the time. I mean, I think in the beginning of my career, people thought that I was slightly arrogant, although I was not trying to be. It's just that I would really just say what comes to mind. But that's also in part due to the fact that I was a, I was a teenager. Imagine, I started my career at the age of 12, 13 years old. When you're that age, sometimes you don't really have a social filter because you're still trying to figure out who you are and you're not fully aware of what's right and wrong. Of course, you're somewhat of a real human being already at that age, but you still have so much to learn. So for me to make those mistakes, uh, I think we're normal, but obviously society being the judgmental people, group of people they are, chose to critique me in a negative way. <laughs> and I think that's in part why um, I'm also very passionate about the topic of bullying because um, I guess now getting into a mo more emotional part of my life is that when I first started my career in Indonesia, you know, a lot of people had a very mistaken idea of who I was. Um, due to the language barrier, due to my direct nature, you know, People thought that I was just banking on the fact that I had that mixed race look and that I wasn't here to stay and I was just like another actress trying to monetize off her looks and that, you know, I wasn't academically driven. I received a lot of backlash on my accent because at the time, not anymore, it's crazy how the world has changed in 10 years, but at the time, there weren't many mixed race actresses or actors with an accent. Now there are plenty, not only that, now there are plenty of Indonesian children who don't even speak their own language. They only speak English, despite the fact that both their parents are Indonesian, which is crazy. And now it's extremely accepted, especially in like big cities like Jakarta. But back then, I guess I was the first, one of the first to surface in the media being that way and people thought that it was a publicity stunt for me to get attention they thought i was faking my accent to try to appear more uh caucasian which is absurd but you know that i'm not gonna lie hurt me for several years because at that age the tender age of 13 as i said i didn't really truly know who i was yet and i felt i kept i i, I would often ask myself what have I done wrong? Why are people making fun of me? And it wasn't on a small scale, but it was on a nationwide scale. Online, I experienced cyberbullying, bullying, verbal bullying, and you know, 
I refuse to play the victim role because I believe that it's important for me to be strong and rise above that. But there was a point in my life where I asked myself, why did nobody, why was nobody there to defend me? Why did nobody realize that it's not okay to bully a 13 year old child? You know, I feel like since the start of my career, people always viewed me as an adult. They didn't realize, I mean, you know, I'm only in my 20s now and I've been in the industry for 13 years. People never gave me the chance to make mistakes as a little girl. Moving to the US, you know, studying there, pursuing a career there was in part a way for me to run away. And why? Because I think deep inside my heart, I hope that by starting fresh, starting new in a country where nobody knew me or like at least didn't know me for what I had done in Indonesia, they would like me for who I am, you okay. know, and truly see my values and who I am as a person. And I would remember like every time I would come back to Indonesia in the summers and the winter, I would feel anxious. I had to like have extreme anxiety because I did not want to have to again relive the bullying that I had experienced. And uh, the most painful thing is that I feel that I didn't acquire respect until people had solid evidence that I had been accepted to an Ivy League university. And that's a, sad, that's a sad truth because why do I need to prove myself in order for people to respect me or appreciate me? That's, but then again, that's me looking at things from a negative light. If I wanted to be negative, I could say, why did it take me getting into a good university for people to realize that I had a brain, <laughs> to put it crassly. But I, try, I always try to switch my perspective and see things from a positive light. And at the end of the day, all you can do as an individual is be the best version of yourself and make sure that everything you do in life, you know, not only makes you happy, but also creates a positive and meaningful impact on those around you. Obviously, Indonesia is such a big country, so it's literally millions of people, right? So I don't even want to imagine how that feels like. So I'm really sorry that you had to go through that, but it seems like you became a very strong woman now. So that's really, for me, even inspiring to see. Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't just like um, in, my, in, my, in my career, right? But like in school, I was bullied as well, because obviously, you know this, you, you probably know this, but like when we're in school as middle schoolers, high schoolers, we're often intimidated or uncomfortable with those who, you know, have a different life uh, from us. And obviously I was bullied in school too, like, you know, ostracized. But then again, I feel like a lot of my passions have stemmed from my painful experiences because that's one of the reasons why psychology was one of my majors in university. My motivation back in high school uh, was, okay, I was able to survive this hell, essentially. But there are a lot of young girls and boys out there who often can't take the emotional pressure and often resort to hurting themselves or even potentially suicide. And a question I asked myself in high school was, even though I had very low moments, how did I survive this? And I wanted to understand the fundamentals behind um, the way humans think and behave and therefore I felt psychology was the perfect major for me. One, it's very useful for my career in acting, of course, because it helps you understand people better, but the true, um, the true reason behind choosing that major was because I wanted to help kids like myself overcome whatever 
they were experiencing because unfortunately you know not everybody has strong family support or not everybody is able to speak up about what they're going through and I know that I was very blessed and lucky but you know it's a cruel world out there and you know we need to try our best to support those around us so if I can make a difference then that's fantastic. Something that was very unhealthy that I've gotten over now is back when I was a teenager due to all the heartache and the pain that I had felt from what I thought was an attack by the whole nation was that I was trying so hard to prove myself worthy and I think that's why I really like you know uh, buried my head in the books because I'm like okay if people want to think this way about me I'm gonna show them that I'm gonna be you know, uh, an, a, an A student who's going to get to one of the best universities in the world. But then again, this is something I say in all my seminars, whether in person or, you know, over the web, is that you should never do something to prove others wrong. You should always do everything for yourself. The only person you need to prove yourself worthy to is yourself because self-worth is based on self-respect, self-appreciation, self-love. And if you're going to base your self-worth on how other people view you, you're never going to be happy, you're never going to be satisfied. And I know that's easier said than done, but I think that's what we as Generation Zs, Generation Alphas, Millennials, really need to be conscious of in the 21st century how to maintain a healthy sense of self despite the crazy um, circumstances we live in. Like you mentioned also that some of the bullying or like attacks that you received in your teenage years are due to the fact that you are mixed. This is something I'm personally very curious about as well, but in the end, what do you identify most as? More as a German or as an Indonesian? If you asked me this question growing up, I would have been very, very confused because, you know, I had always, I had always had a, an identity crisis. But you ask me this question now, it's very simple. I think it's very unfair to ask mixed race kids whether they feel more this or that because at the end of the day, especially in my case, I love both my parents so much and I respect both their cultures that I would never disregard or disown one of them, you know, because me saying, oh, I feel more like my dad or I feel more like my mom is basically a slap in the face to one of them, <laughs> you know, and that's why the way I answer this question is, of course, when it comes to my work ethic, when it comes to the way I see the world, I have to be honest, yes, I'm very much like my father. I'm very German in that sense. But there is also a part of me that's very Indonesian. You know, Indonesia is a very collectivist, collectivistic culture. And, you know, that part of me, my sense of compassion and teamwork and wanting to help others is very very Indonesian and not only that Indonesia is one of the most diverse countries in the world it's an archipelago uh, with thousands and thousands of islands and hundreds of cultures so you know that's something I'm very proud of because I, I you know I'm very confident to say that there is no other country like it and you know this country has such a rich history and such amazing people and I'm so blessed to be able to say that, you know, I have Indonesian blood. Do you think you sometimes have an unfair advantage, just the fact that you are mixed in certain aspects of your life? If this question was asked, I'd say, let's say 30 years ago in Indonesia, the answer would be yes, because, you know, I think Southeast Asians really love the European look. And we can't deny that. You look at beauty products, most of the models are mixed race. But what I've noticed, and this makes me really happy, is in the last, in the last 10 to 15 years, I've noticed Indonesian women especially really taking pride in, you know, how they look. And, um, you know, there's a resurgence of women being confident here, regardless of their skin tone, 
the color or the, the, you know the type of hair they have uh, what 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 ethnic background they come from like they're really trying to promote diversity in this country and that makes me so happy because one of the things that used to make me sad a while ago was that women always wanted to be lighter you know and they would buy whitening cream <laughs> which obviously doesn't work but <laughs> okay i don't think you know my heritage gives me an advantage in Indonesia anymore. In order to thrive in this country, in order to be a great role model for young people in this country, you would honestly have to, you know, prove yourself by showing that you're truly passionate about your craft. So you said you were in Hollywood and you, like, worked with all these famous people together and why didn't you stay in Hollywood then? Why did you go back to Indonesia? Could, couldn't you just have stayed there and just made it big globally as a Hollywood actress? Yes, I had the opportunity to meet and work with amazing people in the US. And I guess one of my biggest accomplishments would be that uh, I was in the running for the role of Nagini in Fantastic Beasts 2. And, um, you know, I had a wonderful manager while I was in the US because he sent me out on amazing auditions for, um, for the Get Down on Netflix, series of unfortunate events, Scream Queens, uh, Shadow Hunters, like all those TV shows that I think we love. <laughs> um, but the reason why I came back was because I would say in 2019, I had an epiphany. I suddenly came to a, re a realization that I needed to go back to Indonesia because my people needed me. And I'm not saying that I'm the only individual in this country who's passionate about what I'm passionate about. Not at all. There are so many people fighting for amazing causes in this country. But I realized that if people like me continue to leave Indonesia to seek other opportunities in, in other countries, you know, we're not gonna be strong enough. You know, the more people like us there is, the stronger we will be. And so one of the things that really opened my eyes was an issue pertaining to uh, women's rights and also child protection. Something that I learned over the course of eight years um, that, that I lived in the US was that um, when women become victims of abuse, the government would normally provide them with free attorneys, uh, social workers to help them recuperate mentally, physically, and basically in every single way. Basically, they would be given all the facilities to be able to stand back up and hopefully pursue a normal life and recover from their traumas. Nonetheless, in countries like Indonesia, I'm not saying those facilities don't exist, but there isn't enough of them yet. And unfortunately, due to the conservative culture, a lot of victims of abuse end up experiencing what you call victim blaming. And a lot of them face the stigma of what they believe to be causing dishonor to their family members, which you know, is a very sad way of looking at this issue because I think we all know that victims are never, ever at fault. It is the perpetrator who has the decision to not take the action that they had decided to take or decide to take. And, um, you know, imagine the mental implications on these women and children who don't attain justice. And so, you know, right now there's a big, issue in Indonesia because the bill on anti-sexual violence has not been passed. If anything, it has actually been put under the non-essential category, which is absolutely heartbreaking because, you know, there was an individual in the parliament who said that it's a difficult topic to talk about and therefore it's not you know, it's not it's not in their urgent list. And, you know, that's kind of a preposterous statement to make because, you know, women make up 50 percent of this nation's population, this 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 world's population with abuse, with bullying comes the lack of self-confidence. And I know 
I was mentioning women's rights, but again, bullying is also an issue that I really care about because I think Indonesia is in, t in the top five of worst countries in the world in regards to uh, bullying rates. And there's no sense of conf confidentiality in this country. You know, there have been cases reported where um, children who experience bullying or women who experience violence often are put in the same room as the perpetrators. Like, you should never do that. They should absolutely be separated so that the, the victim feels safe, you know? So um, I know I have a long journey ahead of me, but the most important thing right now is creating this awareness, making society care about this issue because if I may be honest, I feel like the majority of the people here don't see it as an important issue. And I understand because at the end of the day, we are a developing country. And if, you, if, if, you're, if you're nervous about how you can put food on the table tomorrow or like nervous about how you can pay for your house, you know, you, let's say you don't have shelter above your head, then of course you're not going to think about issue X, Y, Z, but it is nonetheless important. And if there are no rules and regulations protecting these victims, then what are they gonna do? They have no shield to protect themselves. The main reason why we are so interested in talking to you today is because you seem to really use your platform for social good, for different causes. And uh, from what we now establish, your particularly um, advocating for children's protection, women's rights, and also education. Um, which social issue are you most invested in? I mean, I think that changes over time, right? As you get older, you find new things that you become passionate about. But I think at the end of the day, this all falls under the umbrella of education because when I had spoken about women's rights and child protection previously, I told you that one of the biggest problems is um, having the masses be aware of what sexual violence actually means or any sort of violence actually means, what, what types of bullying exists. Like we need to educate. And therefore, I'm very passionate about education. For our global viewers who have absolutely no idea what the, what the education system is like in Indonesia, how would you describe it? Like, how accessible is it for underprivileged children, for example? Luckily, um, pre-K to 12, year 12 is free, unless you go to a private school, obviously. And I don't think it's fair for me to critique the Indonesian educational system because I myself did not go through it. Um, even when I was living in Indonesia, I went to an international school, which obviously gave me a completely different experience. Nonetheless, what I do know based on what I've observed is that um, oftentimes, at least in the public school system, kids are taught to memorize information as opposed to internalize information. And those two are very different things because I think we all can memorize facts. And you know, there are certain facts in life that are very important, like when is Indonesia's independence, day of independence? <laughs> but at the same time, it's very important to be able to internalize information, have your own point of view, and express that point of view. And you know, that is, another word for that is critical thinking. It's important for you to be able to, you know, uh, put yourself in another person's shoes, think of things from different perspectives, because it allows you to not be brainwashed by uh, false information. And obviously with the digital era, um, kicking in, you we see a lot of fake news, <laughs> and if we can't discern, if we can't discern facts from fiction, then we're in deep trouble. We're already in deep trouble. I'm sure many of us have watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix. I think in order to be innovative and creative, it is very important to be able to look at things from uh, different points of views. And if kids aren't being taught at a young age to question things, and you know try understand things from their own approach or try understand things from other people's approach, then we're in big trouble. That is one problem that I do see 
and it's very important that we teach our kids to think critically. You sound like an Asian boss ambassador because our tagline is literally to think critically and to stay curious. So <laughs> that's almost a bit scary because you sound like, like our CEO who literally says that every single day in our office. <laughs> we want to encourage the next generation to think critically. Um, don't just take in every information that you see. And uh, we're doing that by like, creating content, cross-cultural content. That's why we're interviewing you today. That's why, as I've mentioned previously, my family, uh, from my mom's side, founded an organization called Yayasan Sukarseno Paduli, or Sukarseno Paduli Foundation. And the way it started essentially was, uh, when I first moved to Indonesia, I lived in a city an hour away from Jakarta called Bogor. And you know, I think every religion teaches you to first help your neighbors before you help anybody else. And a fact that my mom discovered was that in the city of Bogor alone, which is a tiny city in West Java, there were thousands of schools under horrible condition, meaning some of them had roof, uh, roof the, the tiles of their roof collapsing or like kids were learning on the floor without um, furniture and that's obviously bad for their development, right? Their physical development. And you know, some of them were still learning off of a curriculum from the 80s. Like, what? Like, yeah, it was shocking. And then we came to realize, oh my God, you know, we might not be able to change the condition uh, nationwide, but let's start by doing something in our hometown, so to speak. And so that's in 2004, um, my mom and her family founded the organization. And um, from there on out, they, both my mom and I and her family started working with different organizations like Canadian Aid, Australian Aid, High Desert International from Singapore, and other amazing organizations around the world to rebuild schools in that area. We first started with elementary schools. And so far we have 10 elementary schools with um, you know, great facilities, uh, the newest curriculum, they're no longer studying from books from the 80s. Oh, wow. <laughs> Once we were rebuilding these elementary schools, we realized that there was another problem. And the problem was that a lot of these kids after elementary school would stop going to school because they didn't have the means to travel outside their village, so to speak, to attend junior high. It was too expensive. And you might ask, like, wait, why is it expensive? I thought you said it's a city. So the city is Bogor, but the schools where we were doing all the renovations was uh, on the foothills of Mount Salak. So it's a mountainous region 30 minutes away from the city of Bogor. And once you get there, you have to walk across train tracks go up the mountain a kilometer, and then that's when you get to those schools. So they're, they're literally living on the foothills of a mountain. And uh, you know, prior to us rebuilding these schools, we realized that a lot of these kids, I guess, were targets of radicalism, which obviously isn't good. And you know, they were being taught values that were obviously based off of intolerance and disrespect uh, towards those different from them. So that's obviously a problem because, as I said, Indonesia is such a beautiful country. Um, you know, we're proud of the fact that it's extremely pluralistic, and you know that's what makes this country so unique and special. And so, when we rebuilt those schools, we had sometimes. Um, uh, volunteers from Australia teach the teachers and kids English and back in the day before I made my own income I would come with my school friends and teach them English it was really really fun prior to the renovations you would ask the kids what do you want to be when you grow up and the classroom would be dead silent they had no dreams for themselves because nobody helped them shape the way they think and nobody pushed them to be better and once we, you know, rebuilt these schools and added all these facilities and had teachers who were motivated to teach because they finally got sufficient income, like, you know, you would ask the kids, 
what do you want to be when you grow up? They would scream astronaut, doctor, teacher, and like they finally had dreams. And essentially as a child, it's so important to dream because that's what drives you to move forward. Back to the problem, we noticed that they didn't have enough money to move, progress to junior high. So we finally, uh, you know, did some fundraising and managed to build a junior high in the area. So a lot of these kids ended up being able to progress to junior high and this junior high school not only taught these kids you know regular classes like math science humanities etc etc but they were also taught practical skills so that in the event they really could not continue on to high school they'd at least have basic skills to start small businesses and uh, we also have a scholarship program whereby, you know, the 10 smartest kids would be given a scholarship to continue on to high school. And one of our biggest success stories is about a child named uh, Bonar. He went through our educational system, got a scholarship to high school, and finally attended the University of Indonesia for, uh, University of Indonesia for his bachelor's. And UI, or University of Indonesia, is basically Indonesia's Harvard. Oh, so yeah. that was a huge feat. And once he completed his bachelor's, he received a scholarship to do his master's in Germany, and now he's doing another master's in Japan. So it really shows you that it doesn't matter where you come from, you, really tr you truly can achieve big things if you're willing to put the work. But how does it feel to actually build a school? Like, that must feel very fulfilling, right? I mean, sometimes I look back and I'm like, how did we build 11 schools? <laughs> <laughs> Over 4,000 children has gone through our education system, so, yeah. Um, I mean, it's not just me, though. Like, I need to thank my family, too, because they also put a lot of hard work into what we've done. And, you know, I feel blessed because with my career, I've been able to shed light on the issue. And also with, you know, the income I receive, I'm able to donate, you know, a certain percentage of that for the operational costs because, you know, we still have to pay the teachers. And even though school itself is free, you know, there are some really underprivileged kids who can't even afford uniforms or you know school supplies and we would have to supply that for them so you know there's a lot of cost going into it and what sucks about this pandemic and what makes me really scared is that you know unfortunately indonesia still has a huge digital gap and you can't ex ex uh, expect these kids to study off of a little android phone you know it's hard. I mean, it's even hard for privileged kids anywhere in the world to study, you know, from their laptops. You know, kids have short attention spans. You know, you need a, you need a teacher to be able to guide these kids. But that's what I'm really worried about now. And I hope that in the next few months we can really find a solution because, you know, even quota, internet quota is expensive for most of these kids and you can't ex you can't expect them to be able to study on their own because on their own because some of their parents didn't even finish high school didn't even finish junior high so you know who's there to guide them it's very honorable and even that the fact that you're donating some of your own money um, I don't think you can see that from other like well pe like people who are well off mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it makes me very sad because obviously the rich in Indonesia are extremely rich and donating, let's say, even only $1,000 a month would mean absolutely nothing to them because $1,000 can be spent on a dinner. <laughs> um, you know, some people don't have the compassion. And again, that's why it's important for people like me who have a platform to speak up to constantly remind people of how lucky we are and what we can do. Because, you know, if you, if you convey a message frequently enough, one day at least one person's going to hear it. And if that person conveys the message over and over again, hopefully another person will be moved. So you can never stop. Just because you feel like you're not being heard doesn't mean you should stop. Because if you say it enough, eventually people will listen. So you're still pretty young, right? Um, are there some people who might not take your advocacy seriously or don't take you serious as a social activist? Because 
maybe they're distracted by you being an actress um, and this public figure, an entertainer. Uh, maybe they think, oh, like, what does this person know about uh, women's rights? I hope over the past 13 years I've done enough to build some sort of trust uh, amongst people here. And um, last year I was actually appointed as ambassador towards anti-violence against women and children. I guess that means that the government trusts me in communicating their message. And not only that, we're so lucky that we live in a day and age where so many young people are making tremendous changes in society. I feel like being young actually gives us an advantage because nowadays people see you as brilliant if you have an idea and aren't scared to convey it at a young age. But still, you, you, if you had a choice, right, you could still choose to just be an entertainer, um, just forget about all the negativity that's going on in the country. What motivates you to stay so passionate about social issues and, and continue um, taking action um, and investing your time when you're already super busy with your other schedules? You know, one of my biggest mottos in life is that I refuse to live a mediocre life. So, um, you know, as long as I have the energy, the motivation, the willpower to keep uh, being productive and hopefully creating a positive change, I'll continue to do so until the day I die. There is an age where I feel like I'm going to retire and just relax. I'm not that kind of person. And if that means that in the course of my life I can only influence 10 people, so be it. If it's 100, great. If it's 1,000, lovely. If it's millions, even better. But, you know, I'm going to continue to fight for uh, equality, as I've mentioned before, and fight for a healthy, happy, and stable environment for the for young people, not just in Indonesia, but in the world. And it might take time, but I truly feel like I can do it because the vision's there. I just have to execute it. Was there any role model in your life uh, that inspired you to take so much action to overachieve and um, bring big changes in life? Well, when I was uh, very young, because, you know, entertainment was a passion, or well, still is a passion of mine, I really looked up to Angelina Jolie. Why? Obviously, she's drop-dead gorgeous, <laughs> but I truly do think that she's extremely talented. She's an amazing actress, but what I love the most about her is what she does for the world. You know, she's a UN ambassador, and she truly shows that she cares through her actions. She does visit, you know, danger zones personally to... Uh, you know, check people's conditions and try, you know, make a change. So I truly admire that about her. She's a triple threat. She's beautiful, she's talented, and she cares. Uh, growing up, as I understood more about politics, I started to really look up to Margaret Thatcher. I think that's why I get the Iron Lady vibe. Sometimes people are scared of me because I'm very straightforward, but that's why I admire her because uh, she's not scared of expressing her opinions. She's not scared of uh, upsetting people in order to get things done. <laughs> and that might not necessarily work here, because I think I told you earlier that you have to be careful with your words in Indonesia due to the cultural differences. But at the same time, there are certain things in life where you do really have to just be tough. And yeah. uh, that's why I love her so much. I just love strong women who don't take no for an answer and aren't scared of what people think of them. And, uh, you know, I guess as women, especially in countries like Indonesia, they expect you to be more elegant, more poised, you know, sweet. <laughs> and I can be those things sometimes, but I think my true nature is to be extremely blunt. And, you know, I, I have, I've been told by many people that sometimes I come across as a little scary, but I don't mean to be. It's just I'm not the kind of person who can fake it and be like, oh, my God, Marie, your, I don't know, top is super nice. Wow. Like, <laughs> I'm going to compliment you if I really want to, but I'm not going to give you a fake compliment. Right. You, know? you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've already okay. built 11 schools <laughs> through your parents' organization, but is there something bigger? I think in the next one to two years, 
years, the best thing I could do is first spread awareness. Because again, it goes back to education. If kids aren't aware at a young age what gender equality entails or what it means to respect a person of the opposite gender, then how do you expect them to care about issues pertaining to women's rights or child protection? So first, uh, I need to educate the masses, so to speak, and that can be done through my platform by collaborating with our other organizations and collaborating with other like-minded people. Um, but my long-term goal is to eventually create either small schools or establishments or safe spaces around the country where women are taught um, are taught about how to be confident, how to speak their mind, how to be leaders, how to believe in themselves. Basically, you know, a school to help women realize that they are equal and they are the ones in charge of their own lives regardless of where they come from, regardless of their beliefs. So, um, you know, just like how Bill Gates and his wife Melinda have the Melinda Bill Gates Foundation, I would like something like that that caters to educating women and young children. That would be the long-term goal. But um, I would also like to backtrack a little bit to your question earlier on. You asked me why I decided to return to Indonesia, and I told you why. Um, but besides my love for you know the people of this country on an entertainment level there was a reason why i returned to indonesia i truly believe given how globalized our world is becoming we no longer need to live in cities like LA or New York or London to have a global career. We're so lucky that so many streaming uh, platforms exist. And yeah. Indonesia, being the fourth most populous country in the world, actually contains so many talented people. If Korea, with a, con a con South, South Korea, with you know, a country with 20 million people can have K-pop become a global phenomenon. There's no reason why Indonesia can't have something equivalent to that. So with the knowledge I attain in the US, with the skills I learned in my industry, I really want to participate in helping this country create films, TV shows, artistic content that is of a high quality but can be enjoyed by people from other countries. It's totally possible. It's just a matter of who's willing to do the work. What do you think are what some of the biggest obstacles in, in achieving your huge goals? <sighs> the biggest obstacles, a lot. One of them being how to communicate this message without making people feel like their beliefs are being attacked. That's very important because for us to communicate certain things to people, let's say in Germany, might be very easy because to them, you tell someone the victim's never at fault. They're like, of course the victim's never at fault, you know? But in Indonesia where, you know, certain cultures are very patriarchal and, you know, the people believe that women are supposed to cater to the needs of men, then you tell them this and they'll be like, but my job as a wife is to please my husband. Then like, you know, how do you go about that? You and I might not agree with that, but like for someone who has that value ingrained in their brains, how do you tell them that that's not a healthy way of looking at things? You know, you can't make them feel like they're wrong or their values, their beliefs are being threatened. So how can we teach healthy values? How can we instill confidence in them without making them feel threatened? And that's the problem. How can we take, I guess, you know, an Asian approach to this issue? Lastly, what's your message to our audience that's watching right now? Because, um, I mean, you are obviously advocating for a lot of things. You have some of the resources, but what can an, can an ordinary person do to raise awareness about any social issues they're personally passionate about? 
Okay, to our Asian Boss audience members, uh, please know and believe that you do not have to be a celebrity, a public figure, or an influencer to make a difference. The beautiful thing about the world we live in today is we all have our own platform. And even if that only means one follower, two followers, five followers, whatever that number is, you stating your opinions or what you believe in is still reaching out to someone. And if you, you know, you convey your message consistently enough, someone will hear you. So never undermine your strength because we're all put in this world for a reason. And I truly believe that we all have a voice. Wow. Well, that was a very insightful, interesting chat. Thank you so much for your time today and we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you so much. And I hope we will get to see each other in person in the near future to discuss even more uh, inspiring things and good luck to you guys. I hope you guys continue to show what we in Asia have to offer. Yes, exactly. Thanks to your help, we are able to do that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right, bye, Marie. Bye. See you. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye bye. 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 bye.